I'm Amber Tresca, and this is About IBD. I'm a medical writer and patient educator who lives with a J pouch due to ulcerative colitis. It's my mission to educate people living with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis about their disease and to bring awareness to the patient journey. Welcome to episode 126. My guest is Dr. Amanda Olson, who holds a doctorate in physical therapy and is the president and chief clinical officer for Intimate Rose. Dr. Olson began her professional journey in pediatrics, but she switched to pelvic physical therapy after her own recovery from a horrible accident that significantly damaged her pelvic floor. Today, Dr. Olson specializes in treating pelvic floor disorders, including incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse, pelvic pain, and pregnancy-related issues. She's also the author of Restoring the Pelvic Floor for Women, How Kegel Exercises, Vaginal Training, and Relaxation Solve Incontinence, Constipation, and Heal Pelvic Pain to Avoid Surgery. She shared some of the signs and symptoms that might prompt people with IBD to consider pelvic floor therapy, how to find a therapist, and what to expect when therapy starts. Coming up next, my conversation with Dr. Amanda Olson of Intimate Rose. Dr. Olson, thank you so much for coming on About IBD. Thank you so much for having me. I wonder if we could start first by you introducing yourself so that everyone gets an idea of your background and your education. Sure. I have a doctorate degree in physical therapy, and um, my specialty is in pelvic health, so I have a certification in pelvic health rehabilitation, and I've been doing that for about 14 years now. That's really amazing. When I was doing my research before I started talking to you, I came across how you had a very interesting story, and that was what first got you started in physical therapy. Could you tell me about what happened and how that unfolded and how it led you to where you are today? Yes, it's really interesting. So I expressly went into the doctorate program for physical therapy to specialize in pediatrics. And when I graduated, I was working in a children's hospital and specializing in um, motion analysis and research uh, around children with cerebral palsy and Down syndrome. And, um, and that was my life. And that's why I became a physical therapist. And then I found myself out camping, um, having an adventure. I was still young, but um, out in nature here in Oregon, it's really beautiful. And I found myself in a situation where the boys of the of the group were doing some cliff jumping into the river at 40 feet. Um, so it's this area of the river that's very still and very deep. People have been doing it for a very long time. None of these are good reasons to do it. <laughs> yeah, but, right. <laughs> <laughs> but still, you did. It wasn't like you were doing something that was really wild. You were doing not something that people that something that people do. Okay. Yes, and I'm not a thrill seeker. I'm a runner, but all the boys were doing it. So <laughs> off the cliff I went, and apparently, when you jump off a cliff, you are supposed to land straight like a pencil. And I landed in an L, bottom first, oh, and no. I significantly injured myself. Um, so at 40 feet, water acts and feels just like cement. Um, So I had significant injuries to my spine and my pelvis. I annihilated my pelvic floor. I had to be pulled out of the river. It was a bad situation, but I was okay. And I went to my physician promptly and she, you know, she went through and we looked at the injuries and she referred me to a colleague, physical therapist who specializes in pelvic health to help manage the injuries. And she totally fixed me up. It was a long process and I, uh, I came through it and I was totally on my way to being fine. And she said, Amanda, you need to quit pediatrics. You need to do pelvic health. You have the right personality for it. And we don't have enough in the country. And this was roughly 14 years ago. And at that time, there was just a few hundred in the country. So I was so lucky to have gotten one. And she totally changed my life. So I did, I went back, I had, I had to go back to classes and back to certifications and it's my new purpose. And I am, I'm very thankful. And now I'm here to help other people struggling with pelvic health and abdominal health problems. And here we are today. Right. That has quite a story. How long was your recovery from, from this accident? It was roughly six months. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I dislocated my coccyx, injured all the muscles and tendons and ligaments. I couldn't sit. I couldn't, I wasn't moving very well. Um, 
you know, all of the things that are associated with bowel and bladder. Uh, I had all of those issues because of what had happened. And so I, I came through and honestly, I am fine. I've gone on to run marathons. I've gone on to have two boys vaginally. So for all intents and purposes, you know, I self-manage and I still have things that I have to work on and keep up with just mm -hmm. as part of my maintenance care. Um, but for all intents and purposes, I am totally fine. <laughs> How would that have been different had you not had such a genius uh, pelvic floor health person to help you with all of this? I have to imagine I would have had long-standing issues um, mm -hmm. with pelvic pain because that was the primary driver. Um, and so w when we're talking about the pelvic floor, we're talking about all of the structures that it supports, which mm -hmm. includes bowel bladder and in people with the vagina, the uterus and the vaginal tissue and all of that. And then sexual health and digestion and all of that. And, and then my spine as well. The pelvic segment is part of a team of the entire trunk and of the legs. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it helps to mitigate forces. It helps us to bend and move and, and to have a bowel movement and to retain urine and all of those good things. So I, I think that it, I would have been a very miserable and not high functioning person mm -hmm. without the help of my pelvic floor physical therapist. Mm -hmm. So that leads me into my next question is that how do you describe pelvic floor therapy? How do you explain it to people so that they understand what it involves? And then when they come to, for instance, an appointment, you know, what does that look like? Absolutely. So in pelvic health physical therapy, we treat patients of all different genders and backgrounds and age ranges. So I think a lot of people think like older lady with mm -hmm. problems. We treat men, women, non-binary, transgender. We treat um, little children that have certain issues. We treat people throughout the lifespan. Mm -hmm. And the issues that we help address are issues with bowel and bladder and sexual functioning and abdominal health. So that would include constipation diarrhea, urinary incontinence, urinary retention, pain with intercourse, pain with sitting, tailbone pain, um, and then after cancer, so all the different types of cancer, prostate cancer, gynecological cancer, um, people with IBD who are having constipation issues or maybe they're transitioning after surgery to being able to have a bowel movement again, um, and then abdominal pain because of the systematic relationship with the pelvic floor. So you've described a lot of signs and symptoms already that people might benefit from or seek out uh, pelvic floor therapy. But I think sometimes in IBD and then probably also in IBS or other conditions, people are sort of just living with a thing. They're living with the diarrhea. They're living with the constipation. Maybe I'm thinking about IBD specifically, but it can happen in a lot of places. You're post-surgical, so you're having pain with intercourse, for instance. At what point or, or what would be a sign to someone to say to themselves, I really should be looking into, into these issues being caused by a problem with my pelvic floor, and I need to seek out some help in order to uh, start to get them resolved and get, you know, get on with my life and improve my quality of life? Absolutely. I would say if any of the symptoms we just described are present or any level of botheredness that someone's experiencing, because as you mentioned, people with IBD are living with a lot of discomfort on a day-to-day -day basis, mm -hmm. and that's baseline, and yeah. that's not including the flip flops and the post-surgery and the post-hospitalizations mm -hmm. that they experience. Um, so I would say asking for the referral now, you know, and that's not to say it's, it's never too late, mm -hmm. like try to get it now. But, um, if you're not in a spot, if you're experiencing a flare up and you're not feeling well, and you're just simply not feeling up for the appointments, pelvic physical therapy will be there waiting for you when you are feeling ready and they can be flexible and work with you through those different flare up scenarios. So, um, yes, asking your gastroenterologist or your primary care physician or your gynecologist, if you're a person with a vagina, for a referral is a great thing to do. And seeking out a pelvic health specialist who has some knowledge in IBD is also really helpful because some uh, pelvic health physical therapists specialize in certain areas and don't um, treat as many patients in other areas. So that can be a really helpful thing as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking from a practical standpoint, you've told us how there are not enough people like you in the world or in the country to help everybody that uh, is trying to seek them out. So I'm also thinking about patients who might not have someone near them that they can physically get to an appointment 
or if they perhaps can make a couple of in-person appointments, but then they need to shift to some other modality. Are there things that people can do on their own? Are there things that people shouldn't do on their own? Is there a way to receive this care that goes beyond going to someone local to you and, and getting those hands-on services so that more people can access them? Absolutely. And that's a great question. So the good news is since, since my accident, like 14 years ago, there are now thousands, tens of thousands in the country. Um, and we, um, with my company, Intimate Rose, we can always help connect people um, mm-hmm. with a pelvic provider in their area, but also with the beauty of telehealth is that if you are still too far away, because some, sometimes that still happens, um, if you are still too far away, even having an initial evaluation via telehealth with somebody in your state, so somebody that has a state license, they they can still advise you via telehealth in your state to help get you get a grip on what your symptoms are and to help provide some one-on-one um, consultation to your unique situation because we know people with pelvic health considerations just because they fall under a certain diagnosis doesn't mean that every treatment or plan of care is going to be appropriate for them. Mm. So that's a really great step, especially considering that they may be in a lot of different appointments and may not be able to get in. And then also, there is some self-care techniques that can be impl- uh, implicated. And so um, at Intimate Rose, I create different pelvic health devices to help people manage various types of symptoms, including pelvic pain, um, which is prevalent in people with IBD. Mm-hmm. And that would include the wand, um, and that's to address restriction in the pelvic floor that is often associated with gripping and having pelvic floor muscles that are too tight as a byproduct of guarding either from abdominal pain itself um, or as a, a an unconscious muscle Mm -hmm. activation, Mm -hmm. kind of like um, people that elevate their shoulders into their ears and they get headaches. Um, Uh, I'm like (laughs) shaking out my shoulders as you said that. Yes, I do that. (laughs) Yes, super common. And that that same muscle pattern is actually often done in the pelvic floor. And so the wand is one tool to help people manage that on a day-to-day basis. And that can be helpful, especially those that are experiencing the constipation or that intermittent constipation diarrhea type symptoms. And then the dilators are for people that have pain with penetration, whether it's with intercourse or during their medical exam, those are in place. And now we have rectal dilators as well, which can be really helpful for people that have had surgery around the colorectal Mm -hmm. area um, or who are experiencing restriction or fistulas uh, after they've healed from that. In that way, the dilators can be used to help retrain the brain and the body to tolerate sensation in that area to have that bowel movement. Um, And they can also be used in what we call expulsion training. So a lot of times, especially if people have had a pouch um, or an ostomy bag, and then they're transitioning back and they Mm -hmm. are are having it removed and going back to having bowel movements, the rectal dilators can be used to retrain that coordination Mm -hmm. of having that bowel movement again. It sounds silly because it sounds like, oh, I'm I'm a person. My body knows how to have a bowel movement. (laughs) Isn't this just natural? And it's actually not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we can be very instrumental into just retraining that process so that it's as pain-free as possible and as smooth, for Mm -hmm. lack of a better term, as possible. It's funny that you say that I live with a J-pouch. I only had an ostomy for three months in between the two surgeries to get reconnected. But that was definitely a thing (laughs) to think about engaging those muscles again. And that was a relatively short time. I think that might be one of the shortest time periods that they let people go in between those surgeries. And I know people that have gone much longer. For instance, there are people who decide to... Uh, complete a pregnancy and a birth before they have their J-pouch created. So, for instance, that might be years that you're not using your rectum and then you go back to it. Um, so I could see that that would be something that you might need to learn how to engage those those muscles again and how to use them and what the sensation is like again. So that's a very good point, very relevant to people with IBD.
All right. So somebody finds a pelvic floor therapist. They get all the things in place. They are going to come to their first appointment or their first touch point, I guess I should say. What does that look like? How do you get started? So an in-person, well, both actually, telehealth and Mm in-person, we are, as a patient and a provider, we're going to spend a considerable amount of time getting to know each other and going over your medical history and going over your goals. In physical therapy, we are very concerned with what is bringing you to this point where you're seeking our services and what your goals are. Mm -hmm. And that is our primary concern is to getting you to where you want to be, whether it's to have a bowel movement or to be able to sit without pain or to have intercourse. All of those are relevant. So we do, we spend a lot of time going over your medical history. Um, We want you to feel comfortable in the appointment. So we go over any concerns that you may have. Um, We then in our review and our evaluation of your body, we are concerned with you as a whole person. So we're looking at your posture. We're looking at how your spine and your hips move and what your mobility and your strength and coordination is through your hips and through your back and your pelvis. And then generally we want to evaluate your pelvic floor and we may do that on the first visit Mm -hmm. and we may wait several visits until either you're ready emotionally or you're ready physically. Mm -hmm. Some people are not in a place due to medical reasons and some people are not in a place due to emotional reasons. So it may be on the first day if you're feeling ready and it may be uh, on a later date. Mm -hmm. Um, But in that evaluation of your pelvic floor, we are watching to see if your pelvic floor understands cueing and coordination patterns. So we're going to ask you to contract the pelvic floor muscles, and then we're going to ask you to relax and expand them. We're interested in the mobility. And then during our internal evaluation, we don't use a speculum um, Mm -hmm. uh, in people with vaginas. uh, In people that don't, we would do a rectal exam Mm -hmm. if they were in a place to have it. But we're measuring the strength of the pelvic floor muscles and then also the timing and coordination and the endurance. So they are muscles just like every everywhere else in the body. And if you think about your shoulder and your rotator cuff, Mm -hmm. we would be interested to know what's the mobility like? What is the strength like in certain positions? What are you having trouble with? Can you reach up? And the pelvic floor is very, very similar in that way. So we would measure those. It's usually about 10 to 15 minutes. And then we use that information to help guide our plan of care and our treatment for you as an individual person. We are also assessing scar tissue from any surgeries. If you have a pouch, we're looking to see the location and how your abdominal muscles are coordinating around that. So it's a very holistic Mm -hmm. um, perspective that's going to help us get you where you want to be. It's a very intimate relationship, I guess, as (laughs) as I would put it. Is there a way that you help patients feel more comfortable with how this proceeds and so that they're getting the most out of it because I'm also thinking about people that may have trauma for whatever reason, either medical or otherwise, and then entering into this relationship with a pelvic health uh, professional, it might take a little bit extra to be comfortable and to achieve their goals. How how do you go about that? Absolutely. So it's interestingly... Uh, For us as providers, most of our patients are um, uh, experiencing some form of trauma for whether it's medically or whether it was um, a, a, an abuse situation. So Mm -hmm. just we're in a state as people where, um, people, especially if they're coming in for pelvic health rehabilitation, have often seen a lot of different types of providers and we're just another one in that cog. Um, So the way that we get through that is, again, going back to that um, statement of, you know, we are not on a mission medically. We are here to serve that person. Mm -hmm. And whether they're ready on the first day or they're ready in three months, that is completely driven by the patient and respected by us. And if that's not happening, fire that person, right? Mm -hmm. So find somebody that is respectful that you feel heard with. Mm -hmm. And along those lines, we're all different people. So as Mm -hmm. providers, we all have different personalities. Patients need different things from their providers. So it may just be that somebody's not a good personality fit and you need to see a different provider. They may be a good sound provider, but it's just not the person for you. So finding a good personality match and then um, just understanding that we we are here in service of you. It's different from other forms of medicine where it's like, well, we got to do your 
colonoscopy today, right, you know, right. you're here, jump on the table. Um, it's, jump it's on not the like table. that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. No, that's so funny that you say that because because I've had that. I don't know how common this is anymore, but as a person that had ulcerative colitis, it's happened to me a few times before I had my surgery is that you go in to see your provider and they say, well, let's take a look at what's going on. Hop up, you know, and then they get out the sigmoid, the, the sigmoidoscope and you go, whoa, I was not ready for yes. this to happen today. But I guess I guess we got to do it. You know, like, I don't know. Like, I know that I would have preferred, I think, a more gentle um this is going to sound terrible. A more gentle entry into that sort of thing, you know. Um, you don't always have a, you know, you don't always have the benefit of time. But it sounds like uh, this is this is a long tail situation, pelvic floor health. So it's not a, you know, you have to do this today. You can do it when you're ready. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. You got it. Okay. Good. That's. <laughs> I, I love that. <laughs> I ho- hopefully that makes people feel a little bit better about the whole situation because I think there's. I don't have to tell you. There's there's misconceptions. There's misunderstandings about what pelvic floor um, therapy is, and so it's really great to um, speak to you and get get some of these things uncovered. I want to hear, Dr. Olson, about Intimate Rose, and I want to hear about the resources that you have available on pelvic health, because as I was taking a peek around, you've got a lot. It's really pretty great. So what are some of them that you have? Thank you. Yes. So Intimate Rose is my company where I have pelvic health devices of various types to address different um, issues that people have. And then on that, we have hundreds of videos and blog articles spanning um, almost every issue under the sun. And if I find something new, you better believe it'll be up there. Um, but it's just, we've got videos on how to manage all these different types of issues, whether it's incontinence or constipation. And then the tools themselves are um, different devices, as I mentioned, to address things like urinary incontinence, and that's the vaginal weights. And then, as I mentioned previously, the wand and the dilators are for people with pelvic pain. Um, the wand can be used either rectally or vaginally, and it's a tool to help relieve pelvic pain, whether it's superficially or deep. It's kind of the way, you know, there are these um, hook cane devices where if you have a knot in your back and it reaches back and mm-hmm. it helps relieve the knot for you, very, very similar. Although in pelvic health, it's not a p- no pain, no gain situation. So you're, you're not pushing really hard. It's just there to help relieve that pain. And so with that, there's a manual in every device. We have a really wonderful, supportive customer service team that is guided by myself. Um, and then we have a private support group as well for people to be um, asking questions and sharing stories, um, asking for support or just venting sometimes if they mm-hmm. need some help. Um, so we try to provide like that extension of care beyond the medical team to just be mm-hmm. there for people wherever they may be and to help just be there through their journey. Um, so our, our devices are really pretty. They're very bright. Um, I wanted something to invoke hope and yeah. cheerfulness. Yeah. Um, I think that a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down mm-hmm. and that's kind of the guiding light of the brand. And so um, they're very soft, smooth silicone. So it, when you feel it, it's it's very pleasant. It's not like um, other products that may be hard and plastic mm-hmm. or um, a stickier silicone. They're, they're just really nice and people have been getting amazing results. So it's been, it's been a great process so far. Right. That's fantastic. So if people don't know where to start, they should reach out to the customer service at Intimate Rose and just maybe get some ideas on on where to go and, and what might be helpful for them? They certainly can. I always advise that the best place to start is with an evaluation by a pelvic floor sure. physical therapist. Yeah. And even if it's that consult, um, because that person is either going to do your medical exam or to help get a better sense of what your symptoms are that are driving some of your issues and they can help point you in the right direction as well. So I always advise that that's step one. Um, but if they can't get access, certainly they can go to our website. They can email us at support at intimaterose.com and we can help point them in the right direction. Mm-hmm. So let's go through some of the other places that Intimate Rose has resources available on social media and uh, what's the website as well. Yes. So the website is www.intimaterose.com. And on uh, Instagram, we are at Intimate Rose. And we are now on TikTok as well, also <laughs> at Intimate Rose. It's a sillier form of social media. <laughs> but you're finding that people 
you know, people with a sense of humor really resonate and they are receptive to getting their information on that platform. So we're doing it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Of course. Yeah. It's, everyone learns differently. Yes. Everyone, everyone has different needs too when they're learning. So it's, it's kind of a fun new thing. And then we're on Facebook as well mm-hmm. at Intermeros. Yeah, because if we can't have a laugh about some of this stuff, I think we'll just cry all the time. <laughs> so I um... <laughs> strongly feel that. Yes, exactly. That's great. Yeah, I highly recommend that people follow Intimate Rose across social media for, you know, come for the information, stay for the laughs. Um, yes. So, <laughs> so, Dr. Olson, you mentioned that you have two boys. What's that like being a boy mom? What What are they into these days? I love being a boy mom so much. So they are six and eight. My big guy is almost nine. Um, And so they play soccer, which um, I think is just a great outlet for them at this stage. I don't know that we'll ride that out you know, to the sunset, yeah, but they yeah. are loving it right now. Um, and then they also love to ride their bikes and be outside. And um, they like like Spider-Man and Batman and dinosaurs and all those fun things. The noise level is very high. <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. I I really love being a boy mom. Yeah, I would have been happy with whatever, you know, it's yeah, like, yeah, I'm just grateful to have healthy little people. And, and it's a lot of fun. But they're really sweet too. like my, my youngest likes to bake with me or cook dinner. He's very interested in what the ingredients are. Wow. So it's fun. Yeah, bring that along and, you know, get him to start making <laughs> yes. Give yourself as a little break. <laughs> I love that. Nurture, nurture that skill for sure. It'll pay yeah. off huge dividends. Well, Dr. Olson, thank you so much. Thank you for everything that you're doing for the world of pelvic health, demystifying, bringing some fun, bringing some light into this, which is a can be a heavy topic for a lot of people. I really appreciate it. And thank you for all of your time in talking to me and bringing some of this information to my audience. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so much fun. Hey, super listener. Thanks to Dr. Amanda Olson for uncovering how pelvic floor therapy can help people with IBD. Be sure to follow her company, Intimate Rose, all over the interwebs, as at Intimate Rose and at their website, IntimateRose.com. They have all kinds of products that can address issues with pelvic health. Plus, so much educational information in the form of videos, articles, and community support. I will put all the contact information as well as more resources on pelvic health in the show notes. Links to a written transcript, everyone's social media handles, and more information on the topics we discussed is in the show notes and on my episode 126 page on aboutibd.com. You can follow me, Amber Tresca, across all social media as About IBD. Thanks for listening. And remember, until next time, I want you to know more about IBD. About IBD is a production of Mal and Tal Enterprises. It is written, produced, and directed by me, Amber Tresca. Mix and sound design is by Mac Cooney. Theme music is from Cooney Studio.